welcome to the joint machine uh, learning life statistics seminar. As you know, because you're here, our speaker today is Mike Jordan. I'm going to give the floor to him. I just want to say a few quick things. Um, Mike is one of uh, the key people in statistical learning. He has uh, been largely uh, one, one of the key people pioneering the use of probabilistic methods in machine learning for a couple decades. I actually first met Mike through some earlier work that he had done um, when he was in the Brain and Behavioral Sciences program at MIT as a professor there, doing work on machine learning for robot control and learning forward models and using those to uh, guide the learning control strategy. But since then, he's done many other things. He has won many other awards. Director of the new um, Simon Center at Berkeley, um, and I could give you a lot of things he's done, but I'll give you Mike instead. All right, thank you, Tom. <laughs> Glad to be here. Um, I always like coming to CMU. Uh, a lot of smart people. Um, honored by the big crowd. I don't know if it's me or the pizza. Uh, I guess they're correlated. So let me jump in. Uh, this is a topic I'm pretty enthusiastic about. Uh, the blend of computation and statistics and uh, inference and reasoning and so on and so forth. Uh, it, it's one of the big problems of our day. And this, this word big data, I actually think is real and not just a, a hype. It's, it's a real, real phenomenon. And it's a real scientific problem of the highest order. Uh, it's, it's driving us to think more fundamentally about computation and statistics. Um, so, uh, Let's talk a little about what the phenomenon is. I think all of you have read enough articles in the popular press and so on to be aware, but let me just elaborate a little bit. Uh, we're, we're awash in data, uh, two main sources of the, the data, science and technology. Uh, and science uh, has probably, was probably the leader in doing it uh, for two different reasons. Uh, one uh, is like in particle physics where you're trying to do confirmatory science. You have a null hypothesis um, and you have an alternative. Uh, the null hypothesis is a standard model. The alternative is that there's a Higgs boson. Uh, and how do you have to, why do you have to collect big data? Well, because if, if, if uh, that had been an easy hypothesis test to make, you would have been able to do that with the existing data. and It would have been easy. Uh, it's hard. Now you're out in these energy regimes, which are extremes, and you have to collect huge amounts of data to see a little blip in a, in a certain curve. Um, more commonly is the exploratory mode. Uh, it's not a hypothesis test. You're just trying to collect as much data as you can to hope that new science will emerge. So think genomics or astronomy, um, neuroscience areas, and so on. So very different statistical problem. Well, one case, controlling little blips on curves and finding signal and noise. The other, controlling family-wise errors over vast numbers of hypotheses. Uh, the other one is the, probably the more the technology area you're, uh, we're all more familiar with, measurement of human activity at all scales. Um, now, this has always been going on, and there's always been big data. Uh, and so people sometimes ask, well, what, is, what do you mean by big? Uh, so to me, what's different is the granularity. It's not the big. It'll always be big, it'll be bigger. It's the granularity. Uh, so now in technology, you have data about every single human being, if you're a company of any si you know, size. And that wasn't the case in the past. You have data about every single, you know, three billion or billions of people. Now, you have good, high-quality data about some, and very poor, high-quality, low-quality data about, uh, about many others. And that's the key issue there, statistically, is the difference in the quality of the data. But the granularity is what's changed. And in astronomy, you have data about every galaxy, every star. And in genomics, you have data about every region of the genome, and so on and so forth. So it's the granularity. We're now at the level of individuals. We have data that we care about. And we want to do good inferences across all the individuals. I don't want to leave out some set of individuals. I want to serve all of them. OK. Oops, I did a bad thing there. Try again. Okay, so that's the phenomenon. What about the intellectual problem? So uh, the phenomenon exists. Um, so let's be a computer scientist for a minute. Computer science faces the world and thinks about what are the resources I have to bring to bear upon my, my real world problem. So classically, in theory of computer science, you know, it's things like time and space and energy. And the equations of theoretical computer science were, you know, linking these quantities, usually with big O notation or little or big omega, but they were equations linking various of these quantities. How do they trade off? Okay, data 
has not been viewed in the computer science literature as a resource, as the thing you apply the resources to, it's the workload. You don't talk about um, trading off the data against the time, space, and energy, being happy with more or less data according to how it trades off with the other resources. That's what's changed, is that we're now, in the, from the computer science point of view, needed to view data as a resource that we're interested in trading off against all of our other resources. And what's interesting about this, it's a very different kind of resource than the other resources that we're used to in theoretical computer science. Normally, with most resources, the more of it, the better. If I give you more memory on your computer, you're only happier. If I give you more cycles, you're only happier. And the equations of theoretical computer science quantify that. How much happier, at what rate? All right? Is it the case that if you give me more data, you're hap I'm happier? Well, it should be the case, but it's just not um, in our current state of knowledge. So let's labor this a little bit. Two reasons, one's statistical, one's computational. Um, so the statistical one is a little is slightly more subtle. Let me use computer science language to, to talk about it. Uh, so we're a database person and we think about the world as a table. It's got rows and columns. The rows are individuals, say people, and the columns are descriptors of the people. Age, height, weight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A classical database, you might have 10,000 or 100,000 rows in the table. And the number of descriptors is kind of roughly how many, how many distinctions you need to make among the individuals. So, you know, if it's 10,000 people, you know, maybe age, height, weight, income, and a few other things are enough to, to, to capture the knowledge I want to capture among, um, about those individuals. If I now have three billion rows, which lots and lots of tables now have in them, you know, a few hundreds of, of descriptors aren't enough. I'm going to care about what's your favorite food? Uh, what did you do yesterday? What, what books do you like to read? Uh, what, are, are, what are the sites in your, I want your whole genome. Um, you know, what, I don't, I'm not interested in what city you live in, I'm interested in what block you live in, who your friends are, and so on and so forth. Why am I interested in those things? Because it's granularity. I want to make good predictions for you. Are you going to have a heart attack tomorrow? I want to, I want to predict that, not on aggregate over some city. Um, and I, if you're going to, are you going to click on this ad? Um, are you going to make a certain decision in a cognitive science experiment? And so on and so forth. So highly granular. All right. So uh, the number of columns is going to have to expand. It'll be now hundreds of thousands or millions. Uh, and you, know, you can roughly think kind of linear growth. If I get the rows growing, the columns grow kind of linearly, commensurately. It's not a theorem, but a rough, I, rough notion. Now the problem is that the kind of hypothesis I'm interested in thinking about in, um, in such tables grows exponentially in the number of columns. I'm interested in combinations of the columns. Uh, if you live in Beijing and you ride a bicycle to work and your favorite uh, films or Kurosawa, you know, what's the probability you'll click on my ad or you'll have a heart attack or whatever, right? I'm interested in combinations of columns. Now there's an exponential number of combinations of the columns. And you don't have to be much of a statistician to know if the hypothesis space you're willing to entertain is going exponentially in the number of data points so that your type one and type two, whatever errors you care about is going to just go through the roof. All right? Now statisticians in some sense know how to control errors, family-wise error rates, but not at, at the scales we're talking about billions, you know, these are maybe new phenomena occurring. We may not be able to control things very well at that, at that scale. And moreover, the key issue is that uh, the things that control error rates are themselves algorithms. And they have a certain runtime, and they, they consume resources too. All right? And you may not be able to run them in the time allotted to you at scale. And so that's what happens often in practice. People will do something cheap or turn it off altogether and just hope that they don't make errors. And what you'll see in company after company or in the media is, uh, is false positives galore. People are like more and more data and they start seeing more and more weird phenomena coming out, more and more interesting phenomena, all of which is nonsense. All right, so we're far be behind the curve on being able to control things in terms of error rates at scale. So that's the, computer, that's the uh, statistical issue. The computer science issue I've already kind of alluded to, uh, but it's the following, that all procedures for analyzing data are procedures. They run in a certain amount of time and space and so on. So maybe n squared, n cubed, n log n. And if I have a temporal constraint, I need to make a decision in a few milliseconds or a few minutes or a few hours, depending on what kind of a decision we're talking about, um, then maybe it's sufficient to have an n log n algorithm. But at some number of data points, after you know, a billion, n log n is no good anymore to make a decision that quickly. Oh, I, I get an echo suddenly, an echo chamber. <laughs> Interesting phenomenon. Uh, so at that point, what do I do? Uh, I have too much data for the amount of time I have allocated to me. That's kind of weird. I've got more of my resource and I'm in trouble. So I start maybe throwing away data. But if I throw away data at the wrong rate, I need to know how much is each data point contributes to my statistical risk. If 
I don't know that, I could throw data away at the wrong rate. And my error rate could be slowly creeping up as I'm getting more and more data throwing away the wrong rate. And that's what happens in real life all the time. The other thing you can do is back off to a simpler algorithm. I have this, you know, n squared algorithm, which I love, but there's an n log n algorithm, which is cheaper. All right, so at that point, uh, when I get too much data for my time budget, I start backing off to my simpler algorithm. My simpler algorithm has a higher error rate. So again, my error rate could have gone up at the point I did that. These sound like engineering issues, and they kind of are. It's kind of how do I build a system that really guarantees that error rates decrease as I get my resource increasing? And we're far from being able to do that. I mean, I think this is basically untouched. I mean, a lot of people have worked on things like this, but it's an untouched fundament fundamental problem. So we really have to bring the foundations of, of statistical inferential thinking together with the foundations of, of algorithmic computer science complexity thinking. Uh, here's one kind of way to state such a goal. Uh, given an inferential goal, a, a risk of some kind, a st statistician's goal, and a fixed computational budget. Without that, there'd be nothing new here. That's key. Provide a guarantee that the quality of inference will be, will increase, be monotonically non-decreasing. I'm hedging a little bit there. As data accrue without bound. So the without bound is really the computer scientist in me. I don't want to solve this problem every generation as data get bigger and bigger. I want to find some scale fee principles of some kind to allow us to think about how inference scales computationally. All right, so I don't think we have a clue how to solve that problem in, in real generality. I think it's for this generation to solve it. So I've been working on it, and I have a little bit of progress to report. Um, so I'm going to do this talk in actually two parts. I had planned three, but changed my mind. Um, part one will actually attack that theoretical problem directly, using convexity uh, as my tool, uh, trying to bring computation and statistics together via convexity. Not that new in some sense. And the second will be a little bit more bottom-up. It'll try to sort of say, what are some really good computational principles that we all learn about in computer science? Um, let's see what their implications are for statistics. And my favorite computational principle is divide and conquer. Many algorithms are divide and conquer. Um, it's kind of the thing you first think about in computer science. I got a complex problem, break it into pieces, right? Uh, what could be wrong with that? Well, the statistical principle, the first thing you think about is bring your data together, aggregate it, and the inferences get stronger. They, could, they fight each other, right? So I'm always interested when there's kind of a seemingly a, a conflict. Um, so, you know, in statistics, you also try to break things apart. It's called conditioning and, and so on, analysis of variance and so on. So it's part of statistical heritage, but sort of principle number two after aggregate. Um, so I, uh, we're going to look at divide and conquer statistically. All right, so um, part one. So um, this is joint work with colleague Venkat Chandra Sekaran at Caltech, uh, trying to bring statistics and computation together using kind of convex relaxation. Um, okay, so uh, I've already sort of said this kind of thing. Uh, let me say it a little bit differently. Uh, in computer science, you typically think as numbers of data points grow, it's growing as a function of n, it's the number of data points, that you have to, as n gets large, you have to do more processing. And that's going to cost you. Uh, it'll cost you in space or time or something. But there's a different point of view, which is in statistics, so that uh, as the number gets larger, that maybe the, the, some Edgeworth expansion, then I don't need, I need fewer terms. Uh, some asymptotic thing will work. Some concentration will kick in. Um, I'll get more power out of my data in some sense. And so I should do less work for more data. Um, so various people have been saying this. This is not brand new to me. Um, uh, Shai Shalov Schwartz, uh, Nadi Shribo have been having write, written some papers on this. Leon Botu has said things like this. Um, Right, but we still haven't really cashed this out. We haven't really kind of uh, uh, yet achieved a, um, you know, the kind of uh, unifying framework which allow us to do this in some generality. All right, so let's try to talk about what we need to try to do. Uh, so we need, need trade-off plots that include co computational ideas and statistical ideas. We, we need curves or surfaces that have both in them. Uh, so uh, minimally what we need is the, the one axis is the, the statistician's axis, the number of samples. The other is the computational axis, the runtime. And there's a third axis, which is the risk. We have to have the risk in there, otherwise this wouldn't be, you know, make sense. Um, so what we're going to do, we, we, what, we, what we managed to find, uh, to, um, how we managed to make progress was to fix the risk. Um, that, of course, depends on what problem we're trying to solve, but let's think about a classification problem where risk is the error rate. So fix, say, a 0.05 error rate, and then look at the curve. That was a, that's a, sli a slice to a surface now. Look at the curve that induces between these other two variables. Now, this plot, has, there's areas in this plot which are well understood. So a uh, classical minimax lower bounds in statistics uh, is sort of that line there. It's the minimal number of samples you need to, see, to, 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 to have to achieve a certain level of risk. 
independent of the procedure. So therefore, independent of runtime. And for certain classes of problems, it's known where that line is, and there are procedures which are known which lie on top of that line. Okay, a very satisfying part of statistics. Um, you would hope there would be a corresponding line, there is a corresponding line for computer science, lower bounds, which are independent of, this, of the problem, size of the problem, uh, what's the minimal runtime you need to solve some, some, something, right? And that's sort of one of the main open topics in computer science, non complexity theory, getting good, meaningful lower bounds for broad classes of problems. It's hard, it's just really hard. Uh, but what we're interested in is not the, those curves per se, but we're interested in these trade-offs between computation statistics. So places we want a tutable knob that, uh, that a person have fixed with a set with a, who has a data set and an, and an inferential problem in mind, wants to move along as a function of all these variables, in particular the amount of data they have and the time they have available for their decision. All right, so uh, we finally, we worked on this for quite some time, and, uh, and um, we being several people in my group, and um, didn't really crack it open, it was, it's hard. Um, and finally, with this little simple problem, we managed to make some progress. So this is kind of the bore atom of statistics, it's called the denoising problem. People like Donahoe and Johnston have done really beautiful theoretical work based on it. It's as simple as it can possibly be. Um, we have a signal, X star, coming from some set, which I'm gonna call the signal set, S. Um, it's gonna be noised up, so Z is gonna be drawn from a Gaussian. Uh, Gaussianity is not so essential here. And the um, observation is gonna be the signal plus noise with some scale of the noise sigma, okay? We're gonna get NIAD samples from this uh, data. Now what's complicated about this setup is S. X, S is gonna be a complicated set of some kind, maybe a discrete so we can kind of get integer programs and that's gonna be the source of the computational complexity. Otherwise, there's not, doesn't look like there's a lot of computation here, but that's where it's gonna come in. Um, so we're gonna form a sufficient statistic by its IID data. We're gonna take this, the sample uh, mean and then our, our, our first thought for an estimator would be to solve an optimization problem. We'll take Y star minus X, we'll minimize over X in the set S and that we'll call that our estimator. Um, we're not going to be able to do that for two important reasons. First is computational. That's probably going to be an NP hard problem or worse. So we're not going to even be able to do it if we wanted to. And moreover, statistically, that's going to probably overfit. And we probably want to back off to something smoother, even as a first step. So in fact, what many of us would do is to back off to relaxation where we optimize over a set C, which contains S. It's a smoother version of S in some sense. Um, we're going to optimize again uh, this, this uh, loss function, it's going to be L2 for this talk. Uh, that is an ingredient which is actually important. Gaussianity is not, L2 is for our theory. Um, and we're going to minimize over that, and that, that x hat of n is a function of the set C, and it is an estimator of, of, of x star. How good of an estimator? Um, all right, well, we'll now start to develop the statistical theory we need to sort of characterize that. Uh, so here's an example. Here's S, uh, is it, which being a discrete set, X star is just set one of a set of points. Um, one set that contains S, which is simpler, is the convex hull. Let's call that C. And then we're gonna need a little local geometry to start talking about statistics. Uh, to to let's define the cone around a point X star with respect to the set C. It's just the set of directions that depart from X star and still stay in the set C. So just a bit of convex geometry. And now here's a notion of how good we're doing. This is a statistical risk on the left-hand side. So let me slow down for a second here. Um, so the left-hand side of what we have, we have the expectation of a loss function. Expectation of a loss is known as a risk in statistics. So that's a risk function. Uh, it's, in fact, the difference between our estimator and the truth, x star. Okay, and the expectation is with respect to x star. Uh, or so, well, not with, no, sorry, it's, it, 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 it's the model indexed by x star. So we're centered around x star, we get some noisy data, we estimate with x hat, and we look at the error and take that expectation over multiple draws of the data. So that's just a classical frequentist risk on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is, is a little bit new. So we have a scale factor, we have one over n, and then this other quantity that looks the most complicated is just a piece of geometry. There's no statistics there per se, no data, no n, all right? What is it? It's the supremum over all directions delta in this cone around x star, okay? Directions, because so delta is limited to one, it's just a direction. And then we take the inner product between Z and delta, where Z is Gaussian distributed, and that's where the expectation is hitting. All right? So this, is, this, this object, if you did have the square up there, would be some, we call it something called a Gaussian width or a Gaussian complexity. Uh, we would call this a Gaussian squared complexity. Uh, the squaring is actually important for us to get tight bounds here. It's appropriate for our geometry. But it's still a 
kind of quantity that you would see in empirical process theory, uh, theory of Gaussian processes. Uh, it is a measure of the complexity of the set C with respect to the noise. All right, in fact, you're looking at perturbations, you're looking at a particular direction delta, and you're looking at Z with the, 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 these noisy perturbations, and you're seeing how, how much perturbation can I get? And I'm looking at the worst case delta, so I'm seeing how bad could my perturbations, you know, in the set C. So if C gets larger, I get more directions delta, and that thing on the right hand side can only grow. Okay? All right, so there we're starting to get a notion of a statistical quantity which is growing as I'm getting a, a more simple set, a bigger a relaxation. Computationally, it's the other way around. When I get a relaxation, my computational time goes down typically. I go from a semi-definite program to a second-order cone problem to a linear program and so on. Okay? So we're getting statistics and computation heading in opposite directions. Let's cash that out a little bit more. Let's rearrange that equation. So let's set the left-hand side to some fixed number, like I said earlier. We'll set the risk to some number, 0.05. Let's make it 1 without loss of generality. Okay, so 1 less than or equal to, and now rearrange the equation. To achieve a risk at most 1, I need n data points where n is greater than or equal to that Gaussian squared complexity scale. All right, so if I change C and make my set bigger, on the right-hand side, that number will get bigger, and to achieve a risk at most one, I need to get more data. But I'm happy to get more data, probably because computation, I can do it because I have a simpler set to optimize over. All right, so now we really do have all the ingredients of a real trade-off between computation and statistics. Um, okay, so here's just the, the same uh, story and a little more pictorially. Um, I'm now not gonna look at just one set C, however. I'm gonna look at multiple sets C. I'm gonna look at a nesting of these things, like you typically do in, in theory of computer science or in the combinatorics. Uh, so there'll be C prime, which nests C, and then C double prime, and so on. So I'm going to get these nestings of sets. And what are we going to do on the computation side? We're just going to borrow existing theory. So there's a whole bunch of these hierarchies with names like Shirali, Adams, Lasserre, Perillo, et cetera, uh, which give you computational complexities for optimization over these sets, these algebraic entities. Okay? And you quantify how much simpler the problem gets as you get these, as you go, you get simpler sets, big, uh, more relaxed. Okay, so let's go through a couple of examples to show how this works. We actually could get real uh, theoretical results. Uh, so here's an example of a, of a denoising problem. Um, I, let's assume that S is the set of cut matrices, i.e. outer products, uh, you know, rank one outer products, uh, vectors that are plus or minus one. Um, and we're optimizing over that set S. We can't do that tractably, so we relax it to its convex hole and then further. Uh, and in particular, and there, there's a known literature, there's a good literature on this. If you relax to the convex hole, it's called the cut polytope, and there's an algorithm which runs super polynomial in P. What is P? It's the dimensionality of S. Uh, this is a square root P by square root P matrix. So P is the number of degrees of freedom in my set S. All right, so there's a super polynomial time algorithm which, which optimizes the L2 norm over the cut polytope. Uh, if I'm not happy with that, I can relax further to something called the elliptope, where there's a P to the 1.75 or I can relax further to the nuclear norm ball, and there's an algorithm that is known to run in P to the 1.5. Um, so that's all known, that's the runtime column. What's new is this th third column, um, where we compute the Gaussian squared complexity. Uh, and you do this with some convex geometry, using some symmetries and so on. It's not, uh, it's hard, it's challenge, an interesting challenge, but not that hard. Vincat is an expert on doing this. Um, and what turned out to be really, it was really interesting. What the, the answer is that, in fact, it, it, it increases as you go down this thing. Computation is getting simpler, statistics is getting more complicated, but only in the constant. So C3 is bigger than C2, bigger than C1. Okay? So really the scaling is the same um, for all these algorithms statistically. That's kind of interesting because in the theory of computer science literature where you're not measuring risk, you're measuring an approximation ratio, a geometric quantity unrelated to statistics, you tend to prefer things higher up in these hierarchies. They give much better approximation ratios. The one low down give you terrible approximation ratios. But statistically, we're seeing the ones low down are to be preferred. They're giving you really good results cheaply. And in the massive big data setting, that's a nice message. And in fact, that's kind of a typical folklore. The massive data set, uh, sets use cheap algorithms. They're going to be much better. All right, so here's a little bit of theory to support that. And moreover, that same result is going to occur through all of our examples. So it, it's becoming a little bit more like a real theorem almost. Uh, here's example number two. Let's let the signal set S consist of all per perfect matchings in a complete graph. So in network inference problems, this comes up. 
It's been studied again in vehicle computer science. There are algorithms uh, running on the convex hull on the hypersimplex that have those run times. And you can see again the quite significant difference in run times. Statistically, they're the same up to the constant. So you'd much prefer to work on the hyper, the simpler algorithm, optimize over the hypersimplex, other than that more complicated convex hull. Example number three. Um, I believe Kolar is, is here at um, CMU. Um, take uh, S to be the set of adjacency matrices of graphs with a clique on only square root many nodes. Okay? Uh, hidden, a planet, planet clique problem. Again, study in the computational literature, and here you see a little bit of difference statistically. Uh, there's a statistical risk, uh, statistical complexity of P to the one quarter, and it goes to P to the one half as you go to the simpler relaxation. So here you might prefer to retain the more complicated algorithm for longer as you get more data relative to the, um, the, rela the further relaxation. My favorite example is this one, uh, banding estimators for covariance matrices. So if I have um, big covariance matrix, uh, I have, you know, um, large number, I have a square of the number of entries and it's rare that you have enough data to estimate all those entries. Uh, so what people will typically do is set many of them to zero a priori and, you know, they're called banding estimators. Uh, well, you can only do that if you know the variable ordering of these, you know, of the variables, so that there's actual a well-defined band, like in time series, you would know the variable ordering. Not a problem, you don't know the ordering. Like in a network inference in biology, you would know the ordering. So the inference problem is actually to find the ordering, and then after you found the ordering, you would do the ending. Um, all right, so let's set that up. Um, let's make our signal set be a permutation matrix pi times a known tri and diagonal matrix. So we're not gonna worry even about estimating the banding, that's easy. All right, so um, let's estimate the variable ordering. So now we have, again, a combinatorial problem. So all of our problems are combinatorial because we're trying to stress the computational side of things, right? Um, it's a feature or a bug, depending on your point of view of our theory. Uh, anyway, there is, again, nice computational literature establishing some rates for this, super polynomial and p to the 1.5. And yet again, the statistical rates, uh, statistical complexities are the same up to a constant for this problem. So you would, again, tend to prefer these, these simpler relaxations. All right, so um, I'm done with this part of the talk. Let me just make a couple of remarks. I, again, we kind of support a folk theorem, which is that for really big data problems, uh, you want to prefer simpler algorithms. Um, uh, we have emphasized the fact that we want to study Gaussian complexities of sets, which are we have now tied to risk instead of approximation rates. Those are useful for other kind of problems, but not for statistical problems. Uh, and I think from the point of view of theoretical computer science, it opens up a new field or a new approach to an existing field about, think about all these optimization from the statistical point of view and not from the geomet purely geometric point of view. Um, so anyway, that's an example, that's kind of a little test case. It's an example of what a theory could look like that blends statistical computation. It's not a done, you know, textbook piece of work. Uh, it's kind of an open the door and there's lots more to do. So there's many things we could tweak in our framework uh, but we want to study, uh, study other frameworks, uh, you know, variable selection, model selection, you know, instead of the long list of things where we really try to bring together these notions of risk. It, it's hard, though. Uh, so I, I invite everyone in, but, it, but be prepared to be challenged. Um, all right, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. And I'm going to now turn to part two, which is a little more concrete. So that was a theoretician's talk. Uh, this is, um, in some sense, more of a practitioner's talk. Uh, so the big issue here is going to be parallelization and um, an inference. Uh, so again, let me acknowledge collaborators, Ariel Kleiner, Purna Sarkar, and Amit Talwakar, all been working with me at Berkeley on this topic. Uh, particularly I acknowledge Ariel, who, who this, is, this work is from his thesis. Um, so this is going to be about the, the, the big data, what we call the big data bootstrap, or the bag of little bootstraps. Um, how many of you already know what the bootstrap is? I always ask this question in various audiences. All right, I got a, about a 50% hit rate there, uh, which is higher than in any other audience I've had over the last two years, uh, which is great sign about CMU uh, bringing together statistical thinking and computational thinking. Um, I have to get a 10% hit rate, even in technically sophisticated audiences. I'm kind of blown away by this because bootstrap is one of the big, you know, the top five statistical ideas of all time. So now it's hard to argue with it. If I'd ask you, how many of you know what the FFT is? You know, it'd be 100%. So the big idea in signal processing, everybody knows. The big idea in several fields, everyone knows. The big idea in statistics aren't as well known, even to this day. We're all talking about statistics and all that. It's just not, it's not out there. All right, so one thing you learn today is what is the bootstrap? It's just a you know, nice way to think about certain classes of problems in statistics. It's not everything. It has its problems, and it's like most things. But it is important to, to have it in your, in your conceptual baggage. All right, so what is the bootstrap about? It's not about trying to get a bigger, 
black box that does classification or regression, all right? A lot of big data work is on get the better, faster algorithm to do things we already know how to do or paralyze it. That's all great, not, not nothing wrong with that. Um, but the bootstraps have a different problem, which is trying to say, how good is that black box? All right, now, you know, well, a lot of people work on how good are algorithms too. Isn't that kind of Cisco learning theory or whatever? Yes, but those are a priori bounds, a priori results. Bootstrap is about a posteriori results. You've got the data, you fit something, how good was what you fit? Give me an error bar on it, confidence intervals. And so statisticians care a lot more about the confidence intervals, how sure are you are what you're saying, and less about the point estimate per se. And machine learning has kind of been the counterpart of, uh, it's still a statistical field, but it's kind of the counterpart. We care more about the prediction and the uh, point estimate than the, and not even often worry about how to get an error bar. Okay. So we're going to worry about error bars today. Um, and the bootstrap is one generic way to get error bars. And so let me mention that I've been working with database people for now a couple of years trying to build real databases that for every query that comes in, you don't just give out an, an answer, you get out an answer with an error bar. For a database person, this is radical thinking, all right? I, I, I think it's just, it has to be the case. Um, all right, so, so let me just briefly say what the bootstrap is. I think, I, before I get on, I'm gonna do it formally here, but I think it's nice to give just a classical example. Um, let's suppose I mentioned the central tendency of some population that generates data, all right? Central tendency, whatever that means. Um, and I have an estimator in mind, it's the sample mean. All right, and so you calculate the sample mean on your data points and you know, out comes the answer 10.2. And if the answer were bigger than 10, I'm gonna have a serious surgical operation. And you tell me it's 10.2. Um, so I say, are you really sure? Is it really over 10? And, and you say, well, I can give you an error bar. It's something called the standard error of the mean. I take the sample standard deviation divided by square root of the number of data points. And now I get an error bar and yes, indeed, you're surely over 10, you better have that operation. I say, okay. Um, now, instead of calculating the sample mean, someone else uh, said, well, why, do you, why, do you, why don't you try the median? There might be some outliers in this data. Um, so you, know, you calculate the median, and it comes out to be 10.3 or something, right? And I say, well, are you sure? Uh, give me an error bar. They say, well, I don't know a formula for that. And so, in fact, there isn't a formula uh, for the standard, for the, the error bar for the, the median. That seems crazy, you know? The median is better than the sample mean for lots of reasons. We don't have a formula. All right, so how would you get a, a sta an error bar for the uh, confidence interval? Well, you could do the following. Suppose you have 100 data points. Um, how do you get the median? Roughly speaking, you sort the data and find the thing in the middle. It's an algorithm. All right, there's faster, there's, you know, there's clever ways to do that, but that's basically the idea. It's, it's a sorting algorithm. All right, so I get some number, 10.3. Take the original 100 data points and sample them with replacement. I'll get a different perturbed data set. Sort them, find the thing in the middle, I get the median. Do that a couple of hundred times. And now I'm gonna get a fluctuating value of the median. It'll have some little spread, all right? Calculate some measure of that spread, say in the range, and report that back as a confidence interval. And the amazing thing is that's a reasonable thing to do. It's correct in a, in a frequented sense. As the number of data points gets large, it will cover the central tendency, the, the advertised number of times, per percentage of times. All right, so that's the bootstrap you replace median with sort of many other classes, not every possible estimator, there are some problems, but with many, many estimators, say logistic regression, it'll work. Okay, so now you know how to get error bars on your machine alg learning algorithms. Now why did I get interested in this whole topic again? It's a 40 year old topic. Well, it's totally parallelizable. Those 200 resamplings can be done totally in parallel. You have your data sitting on a server, you sample 200 times sending it off to your 200 processors on the cloud, each one of them runs whatever algorithm, you, your black box, reports back an answer, and then you get the fluctuations back at home base and you report your error bar. So it seemed like a perfect match, cloud computing. You know, this is when cloud computing first started to come out, this, this thought occurred to me. But there's a gotcha. There's a couple of gotchas, but uh, there's a gotcha. The main one's gonna be computational. Can we do this at scale? And the answer is no. All right, so let's be a little more formal now. So we have data, x1 through xn. Um, we're going to form a parameter estimate theta of, X, of some functional of xn. It doesn't have to be a classical parameter. It could be a prediction. It could be a whole function of itself. And it's just the black box I've been talking about. I'm not interested in theta n per se. I'm interested in the quality of the theta n. So a uh, confidence interval. And I'm going to be calling that psi. Right? An a posteriori estimate of confidence, not a priori. So what is a frequentist, how does a frequentist think about this problem? This in some sense defines frequentism. 
Um, what you would do if you were an ideal frequentist, you would not have just one data set of size n, you'd have multiple data sets all of size n. You compute your estimate, your black box would apply to all those data sets, and now you'd have fluctuating values of your estimator. That, 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 that thing is called a sampling distribution. That's what a sampling distribution is. And you would use the sampling distribution to calculate some notion of spread of your estimator. Okay? And it would typically go down as you get more data points, so maybe with a square root. Um, all right, so we can't do that because we only have one data set of size n. But let's now con think about conceptually what we, how we would set up the uh, ideal frequentist. So um, as statisticians, we imagine the data came from somewhere. There was a generating distribution behind. There was a population that the data came from. So let's imagine the supreme being up in heaven has that population and is throwing down data sets of size n to humans on Earth. The supreme being um, can calculate estimators by um, uh, and, and sampling distributions. And so the supreme being does that by taking the population, sampling from it once, twice, m times, getting m different resamplings all of size n, calculating the estimator on each of those, and then putting them into some formula that calculates the error bar. And the supreme being does this up in heaven in the cl on a cloud computer. Perfect match, right? Uh, in parallel. It's a totally parallelizable procedure, the classical frequentist um, idea. All right, so we only have one data set of size n, so we can't, we, you know, we can't be like the supreme being. All right, what do we do? Well, here's the population. We got one data set of size n. Take that data set and form a histogram based on the data set. All right, you've thrown away the notion that it's a list of numbers in a file. It's a histogram. A histogram is itself a probability measure. It's a discrete measure but it's a probability measure. It's in the same space the population is in. All right, from that probability measure, I can generate data. I can generate one data point if I'm drawing from that measure, two, as many as I want. I could draw n or more or less, any number I care to. All right, if I draw more than one data point, what I'm doing is actually taking the original data and drawing from it with replacement. Drawing from that discrete object. It's a discrete object, right? It's got mass, mass at, the, at the original data points. I'll draw one of the data points with proportion, pro probability proportional to the number of times it occurred in the sample. All right? After I've done that once, I could do it again. I might get the same data point again. So I'm drawing with proportional. All right. Now, that histogram is an approximation of the population. There's kind of classical theory that says it's uniformly so. It's a uniformly good approximation. No matter what the underlying distribution is, the histogram approximates it. You know, not so good in some cases, you know, with the data. If the fact there was ever a population at all, take your data, form the histogram, treat that now as the population, and now you're the supreme being in a world where that's the population. And now you mimic the steps the supreme being went through. You have the exact same diagram where on the left-hand side you have, I should have drawn the histogram instead of the actual data. You have the histogram replacing the population. You sample from the histogram once, twice, m times. You plug that into the, S, the black box estimator, and you then plug that into the same formula the supreme being used to calculate your confidence interval. All right? That's the bootstrap. It's often called a plug-in estimator because you just plug in for the population an estimate of the population. That's all it is. And how would you do theory of this? Well, if this is close, if this histogram here is close to the population in a functional sense, in a measure theoretic sense, and all those operators are smooth in some kind of a functional sense, then it all carries through. The answer you get out will be close to what the supreme you gets out, because everything's smooth. And that is the theory, basically, of the bootstrap. OK, so that's the classical bootstrap. What, is, what about the computational side of this? Um, well, it's seemingly beautiful match to parallel distributed computation platforms, but we have a problem. What if I have a terabyte of data? When you resample a data set with replacement, you get about 0.632 of the original data set appearing, and the rest of them points not appearing. All right? So if I had a terabyte, I'm going to get 632 gigabytes. So if I go back to my diagram here, if I start with a terabyte over here, on each of those arrows, I have to send 632 gigabytes. That's going to blow up my cloud computer. All right? It's not going to be able to do that, at least fast. It's going to take way too long to get the error bar, and the user of this technology will turn off my error bar machinery. Exactly what I don't want to happen. Okay, so I got a bit of a problem, which is that this is so-called computational friendly procedure. It doesn't require mathematical assumptions and so on, um, but I can't do it at scale. 
All right, so to me, that's a major issue. How do we, you know, if we're going to grow and scale as time goes on, you know, we have to have procedures at scale. How can we get the bootstrap to scale? All right, so the first thing you would think about would be you would take little subsamples of the data. Not, let's don't take all the data, take subsamples. And there, in fact, is a procedure known as subsampling. It was developed mainly for, by these authors here, Politis, Roman, and Wolf, mainly for theoretical reasons. There are some cases where the bootstrap breaks theoretically, and they were able to patch it with, by taking smaller samples. Um, so they weren't responding to the computational issue. Think about it now as a computational problem. Um, but here's a, there's a real gotcha here in this subsampling idea, which is that I'm trying to get error bars from my original data, which is n. If I take smaller samples, for many, many black box procedures, that would be fine. I would get a problem. I have a you know, large amount of data, and still a pretty big sample. I'll get an OK approximation. If I'm trying to get error bars, I'll get completely the wrong answer. If I take, say, one tenth of the amount of data, and my error bars are going over off by square, uh, square to 10 factor, you know, completely wrong. All right, so error bars are rather different than you know, your usual machine learning kind of black boxes. You've got to think about them in a, in a different way. All right, but anyway, what is subsampling? Um, it is the following idea. You take the original data, it's of size n, think about that histogram again, and now you subsample b points from n, okay? So maybe a terabyte, a few gigabytes. And now I apply the estimator to that, all right? And now I do that again, because there's many ways to choose b points from n. There's n choose b, all right? So I can do it in Monte Carlo. I can do a whole bunch of them, and I'll get some spread in my estimator again. Right, but now I hope you realize the, the problem I alluded to is present. The, the, the fluctuations of the estimate is on the wrong scale. It's on the scale, scale of B instead of N. All right, so the proposers of this idea were aware of this, and they said, yeah, you, you have to deal with this. You have to analytically correct the error bars. All right, so if you knew your estimator was on the square root of N scale, you would, you would correct the error bars are too big because you were basing it on small amounts of data. You actually had more power. And so you would multiply by what? Square root of um, B over N. All right, but what if we don't know if we're on the square root scale? Maybe our estimate, someone wrote a black box in some database. We don't know if it's a square root uh, convergence estimate or not. We'd have to do the math to figure that out. So it was a little bit of an overhead mathematically in using this kind of procedure. There's even a worse problem, which is empirically it has some, some, some issues, some lack of stability kind of issues. Um, so uh, let's give you an example of doing this. We've done a whole bunch of such examples. Here's just one uh, with linear regression. So there's not a lot of details that are that important here, but it's, we just did an experiment with 50,000 data points, synthetic data, uh, covariate space is 100, and um, we're doing least squares. Uh, we're going to estimate, we're, since we did synthetic data, we can compute the true sampling distribution, and we can get our confidence intervals, and we can get relative confidence intervals. We can see how accurate we are. Um, and now the key point here is that B, B is going to be chosen as a power law. It's going to be N to the gamma for gamma going really between one half and one. One half is square root subsampling, pretty aggressive, and one is no subsampling. All right, so here's an example of the kind of results you get. Um, so on the x-axis is time. These are sampling algorithms, taking, you know, sampling away, and this is all on one computer, no parallel computing yet. Um, and there's relative error. It'll come down. It won't go to zero because the number of data points is being held fixed, but it'll go to some value. And the bootstrap is the blue curve. So it's coming down relatively quickly and stabilizing. Subsampling for various values of the exponent gamma is, showing, uh, is shown up there. So for 0.5, square root subsampling, it's just totally failing. Okay, that's that black curve up there. It'll run. It'll give you an answer. Unbeknownst to you, it's just the wrong answer. Uh, point 0.6, it, it's still failing. Point 0.7 and 8, interestingly, it's, do, it's, it's, it's working, and moreover, it seems to be more computationally efficient than the bootstrap. It's converging much more fast, and to the same answer, roughly, as the bootstrap. But then again, for point 0.9, it's failing again. So there was a little range of this tuning parameter where it works, and outside of that, it fails. The problem is that range is not known a priori, and it varies across problems. So this would be hard to put into a database. Okay, so um, anyway, we have a solution to this, which is a new procedure we call the bag of little bootstraps. It's a doubly nested procedure, which um, we think, uh, roughly speaking, solves this problem, at least a, main, a, a part of it we were focusing on. So it's going to still work with small subsets of the data. I mean, you have to do that to make progress in these massive data, big data problems. You have to start to think about subsampling. Um, so it's going to be paralyzable still, but it's not going to require any analytical rescaling. Okay? You don't have to, in principle, think about your problem all that much. 
and it's going to be successful in practice. All right, so it's a really simple little idea. Um, so let's go back to this figure we had before. There was a population, there was n data points, and then we subsampled a, a subsample of size b. Okay. All right, now forget the fact there was ever an intermediate stage there. Just think about those b points as themselves having been sampled from the underlying population. Because okay, we thinned them with IID sampling, so they're still IID sampled from the underlying population. Again, there's this standard theorem which says that the histogram based on those beep data points is a uniformly good approximation to the, um, to the truth. Now, I did this with, you know, 10 data points, so it looks lousy, but if we're thinking terabytes and gigabytes, it'll be a pretty good approximation of the truth, too. Not as good as if I had the whole data set. We, worse, but pretty good. So again, imagine now that there, you, don't, you don't know the population, you're not the supreme being, but you live in a world where that's the population. It's again a probability measure on the space of probability measures. It's discrete, and you can use it to generate as much data as you want. And all right, here's the key step. You wouldn't want to use that object to generate, again, B points. That would put you on the wrong scale. But you can use that object to generate N points. And I do it again, and generate many resamplings of size N. All right, a little simple idea, which I, has been missed in the bootstrap literature, that you can do this. All right. So you take your little resample, and you bootstrap the resample working at the correct scale of n, just by sampling from that object n times instead of b. Um, I'm going to show the picture instead of going through a little bit of English here. Um, I think that's better. It's a doubly nested procedure. And what the key, what you need to do is think of this as a cloud computer. And this is all pair, every one of those branches is, is pair multiple, multiple processors. And I want to make sure I never have to send something like 632 gigabytes along any arrow. That'll kill me. It's got to be small gigabytes for this to be reasonable. Okay? So in fact, let's think that through. So we have, we start with, with a terabyte, say, and we subsample. We send the first subsample up to that processor up there. So let's say, as an example I'll show here, is this, uh, we had a terabyte, it goes down to about four gigabytes. So we send four gigabytes up to that processor. Now it's going to bootstrap that subsample. That's that top box there. All right, so what does it mean to bootstrap the subsample? So I have a subsample of four gigabytes. All right, I'm going to sample from that with replacement n times. The stupid thing to do there at that point would create a big list of n numbers. I would have my, that arrow up there being like 100 gigabytes. So don't keep the original data points. And every time one of them is resampled, just have a count. All right, so send the support, which is of size b, with counts. Right, so if my estimator theta hat can handle weighted data with counts, then I'm good to go, all right? And many estimators, M estimators, support vector machines, logistics, you name it, can handle weighted data. All right, what if you have an estimator that can't handle weighted data? Well, then what you do is you stream your data. You take those, the, um, you, you, you create this thing in a streaming fashion, and it, it streams up to the data, all right? So you would never, again, a massive block of 600 gigabytes. So in either case, we're okay. All right, so you did that up in the top there. You bootstrap this subsample, and out pops psi1 star there. That is an error bar, and it's a correct frequentist error bar. Because what we have done is bootstrap on the correct scale with no analytical correction needed. It is a correct frequentist error bar. It has the coverage and so on. It's just noisy, though, because it was based on one possibly unrepresentative subsample. All right, but now do it on your cloud computer a few hundred times and get 200 error bars in parallel. All right, and now merge the error bars. One way to think about that is that error bars are upper and lower quantiles and just combine the quantiles. By averaging them, not so smart, that in some more robust kind of way with working with quantiles. All right, take a meeting of the quantiles, say. All right, that's the procedure. So we call it the bag of little bootstraps, a little bit of a nod to Leo Breiman. This has a bagging flavor, and each one of the bootstraps is little, and there's no analytical corrections needed. Um, so an example down at the bottom there, as I've already alluded to, is that if we do n to the 0.6 subsampling on a terabyte, uh, then four gigabytes is the ma maximum amount of data we need to transmit in our parallel computer. Um, all right, so does this work? Um, yeah, so here's an example of it uh, in that same setting we were before. We had 50,000 data points. Um, and again, the bootstrap is the same curve as before. is coming down over time. This is on one computer. Again, no parallelization yet. Um, 
And now for various values of that exponent gamma, the VLB procedure is, uh, is working for all of them. And not only is it working, it's actually computationally more efficient than the bootstrap. All right? And you can understand that. There's a, it's not that surprising. In some sense, this procedure is, the, the bootstrap is the limiting case of the procedure where a gamma is equal to one. So we're giving ourselves more freedom, and in that freedom, we're giving ourselves some computational benefits for some reasons I could explain. Uh, so even if I have a, just a single computer, no parallelization, I might prefer this new procedure over the bootstrap. In fact, I would. I would stand behind that statement. Um, okay, so there you go. That's, it. That's an example of it working, and there are many other examples where it, it works. Uh, it does fail in situations, but those are situations where the bootstrap also fails. Um, okay, so the next slide is my favorite of all times. Um, it's a, uh, now we're going to do this on a real parallel computer. Okay, so this was done on Amazon EC2. And um, we're going to do this with, I think this was a quarter terabyte of data. Uh, so again, synthetic data is we can get ground truth and see how well we're doing. But we still want to compare to something else, so we're going to try to compare to the bootstrap. As I've alluded to, it's going to be hard to do the bootstrap at this scale. Right? But it's not ever impossible if you're a good engineer, um, and my students are good engineers. So Ariel actually did this. Um, so what he's done is with this quarter terabyte of data, he wants to do the bootstrap. This is going to be logistic regression. So just, we just picked the logistic regression. And um, with this quarter terabyte, you do logistic regression and the bootstrap. Okay, so we can't do that in this fully parallel way I've talked about. What you can do, on the other hand, is parallelize logistic regression. All right, so you can do a stochastic gradient or some other approach to logistic regression and parallelize that. So it's not all that hard, but it's not all that easy either. It was sort of you know days to weeks of work to get it to really to be effect to work effectively in a real parallel environment. Uh, so you really wouldn't, if you're a company, want to have to do that. But you can do it. And in fact, that's what happens on this plot here. That's the blue curve. So it's a function of time. And this is wall clock time, but on a parallel um, um, system. That's the, uh, so the, so I get my original data, resample, I create a big data set of size quarter terabyte. I put that on my parallel computer to solve logistic regression once. All right? That takes about, I don't know, it's about uh, 2,000 seconds. To, to run. Okay, then I do again have my parallel computer do logistic regression and do this. So we're doing bootstrap sequentially on the parallel computer, and that's the blue curve coming down. So it takes about 15,000 seconds to get at all close to an answer. It's, it's going to actually get better, um, you know, maybe 30,000 seconds or something to get this error bar. All right, so that's not very satisfying. 30,000 seconds to get the error bar. Probably people won't use this in real life. Uh, Although I should say you can see from this curve how long it takes to solve the original get the point estimate. That's just one iteration of this, so it took about 2,000 seconds. That's not very satisfying either. Okay? Now you could do this, you could be a good engineer and spend years really doing it better, and you know, you, that's what people do in real life. But there's an alternative, which is to do this new BLB procedure. So the BLB procedure is just the block, the doubly nested block box I showed you before. It can just be paralyzed as I've explained. No, and that can be done in a few lines of code. You know, we'd want to belittle the amount of effort. There's always some effort, but it's really much, much easier than paralyzing logistic regression. All right, so you just do this, and um, that's the red dot there. So the whole thing goes out to the parallel computer, comes back, and gives an output in that amount of time, which is about, I don't know, 300 seconds. All right, and the accuracy it achieves relative to ground truth is, is significantly better than the bootstrap after 15,000 seconds. So I'm used to getting these sort of 10% improvements, 15% improvements in some algorithm, and then you know, if you get that much improvement, you report it in the New York Times, and you know you glorify your work. Um, this is really massive improvement in an old classical algorithm. Yeah, it, what we've just done is rearrange it to fit modern distributed parallel computing. We've thought about the algorithm in a brand new way, you know, so we're bringing statistical thinking, but bringing this modern distributed parallel computing, and not just paralyzing existing algorithms, we're refactoring the algorithm. And I, I think this is going to happen again and again. I don't think, I think this is just the tip of an iceberg, okay? Um, this is what's going to happen a lot. Um, now, uh, an interesting sidelight of that is look how fast it's, it's, it, we are able to get an error bar. How long did it take to get a point estimate? Again, that's the, the, uh, the first blue point there. It tells us how long it took to get one point estimate. Suppose I really want to get a point estimate, you know, that's what machine learning people are trying to do on my terabyte of data. That's going to take a lot of time. Right? Suppose that I do logistic regression, I get a point estimate for my prediction, and it turns out to be 0.7, right? 
What if instead I do the BLB procedure very fast, much faster than getting the point estimate, and my error bar was you know, 0.705 to 0.715, right? And I take that little error bar and I take the thing in the middle and I say you know, 0.71, that's, that's your point estimate if you want a point estimate. But I'd rather give you the error bar. Don't you want the error bar? All right? And here's the interesting fact is that I, I, it's much cheaper to get the error bar than to get the point estimate. All right, so to me, that's really interesting. That kind of turns around our obsession with these black boxes that have input-output behavior. It says, no, think inferentially. Think about the confidence that you're trying to get out of this system. And that actually might be computationally much cheaper than getting the point estimate itself. All right, so it's a little bit of provocativeness there. One could try to refactor logistic regression, do other things too, but there, there is a story here. I and mean, I think this is one to, keep the, to, be, to start to pursue in other domains. Um, all right, so I'm a theoretically kind researcher too. I thought it was essential that we do some theory of the, um, uh, this new algorithm, and, uh, but I'm not gonna go through it in the talk. There's a paper going through it. So what, one of the beautiful facts about the bootstrap, which I haven't actually alluded to at all, uh, is that uh, you know, bootstrap error bars are themselves statistics, and they have an accuracy of some kind. Um, and their accuracy is, is pretty good. They're, it goes as one over n. It beats the essential limit theorem. The accuracy of error bars based on the asymptotic use of central limit theorem is one over square root of n. The bootstrap error bars are what are called higher to correct. They go as one over n, right? Um, so you would like to know whether this new procedure still inherits the accuracy, the higher order correctness of the bootstrap. It, basically it should, because it's kind of the bootstrap, uh, but the averaging operation could kill that. It turns out it doesn't. So we still get the higher order correctness. And I'm just gonna skip over that. You basically do Peter Hall style Edgeworth expansions and you establish that you get still higher to correctness. All right, so I'm done. I hope that was about the right amount of time. Yes, 54 minutes, good. Um, so uh, let me just step back again. So this has been a couple of little uh, anecdotes or vignettes. I, I consider both these like, you know, bohr atom kind of thought experiments. This is not necessarily something you would deliver per se as here's, you know, the, you know company X use my stuff. Um, I should say, why was I driven to work on big data? Uh, well, I do spend time in science and in technology and consult a bit and doing more and more over time as, it, as these issues are being, being affecting us. And every time I'll go in, I'll say, well, uh, I have a great new idea, you know, my team and I have worked on something called latent original allocation or something like that. It, you know, it might solve your problem. It's really cool. And they say, well, we'll work on a terabyte of data or now they're saying petabytes or whatever. And I'll say, well, no, it won't work on that scale. Uh, but if you sample your data and throw away most of your data and just look at it, analyze a little subset of it, it'll work on that. And they sort of say, well, that doesn't sound very, that's not what we want to do. Um, and um, so this is only getting worse over time. And uh, they say also then, well, can you give me a guarantee that after, even after you subsampled, it'll still be mostly correct? And moreover, can you make sure it'll be correct within a few milliseconds? Because that's my business model. And I'll say, we can't do anything like that. And I've been doing that kind of talk or consulting job and talks uh, for like 10 years now and I just got totally frustrated with having to say stuff like that. Uh, so we should be in a field that has its science and engineering and mathematics all together. We should be kind of like engineers and you know, giving some guarantees. You know, an engineer who builds a bridge gives some guarantees. You know, the bridge might fall down but you can quantify the risk and so on and so forth and you, that's part of what you provide the client. And we should be doing that too. We should be having some real engineering kind of guarantees for our procedure and not just sort of a priori theoretical guarantees or just, we built it and it works on lots of data. All right, so um, I've been very satisfied. I think that when you add the temporal component, you demand to make decisions a certain amount of time, that changes everything. Um, and also human beings, and you know, I'm a cognitive scientist uh, by training and really at heart, um, and I'm always thinking about how are human beings so darn good at these things in real time. That to me is the key. If it weren't the real time, you know, mm -hmm. big deal, but it's the real time. So I'm trying to get at the foundational issues that permit us to say something about inference in real time. Um, so anyway, uh, yes, it's a, it's a systems problem, database systems problem to make big data work and all that, and it's great, a lot of people are doing that. Uh, and, uh, but I also want to emphasize there are comp conceptual challenges that go back you know, hundreds of years to the foundations, you know, at least decades, uh, you know, decision theoretic statistics, walled and so on, setting up what is the risk and why do you want to think about it, and the foundations of complexity theory. Uh, they were really done separately and they've got to be thoroughly in, in, intermeshed and this is now driving our thinking in this regard. Uh, we've done other work in other areas where we've taken divide and conquer thinking, uh, we've applied it to matrix completion, 
And there again, uh, it turns into a theory problem because you can just naively divide and conquer any kind of algorithm, and the question is, did you retain some theoretical correctness? So I think this actual emerging field is not so much the systems building as it is the theory. It's gonna say, well, did, when you start doing these o weird operations on data, what's the theoretical guarantee? So I think we're gonna become even more theoretical um, because of this. And I've also emphasized algorithmic weakening. Again, we just did this little simple first thought experiment on algorithmic weakening, but I think it's a nice concept. It might be thought of as a new area in statistics and maybe even TCS. Um, so thanks, I'm done. Happy to entertain any questions. Yeah. 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 No, we've thought about it and don't really have a good solution to it. So please work on it. Um, I mean, there should be some kind of a multi-scale way of doing multiple kinds of samplings within samplings. You know, instead of just two things, there should be more nesting. So maybe that's a way to do it. But at some point, you also have to say, this is just really a thought experiment. What kind of real inference are you really trying to do on a petabyte of data? And what class of inferences? And you know, I'm not trying to do all possible inferences to control for all family-wise error rates over all possible things. I'm trying to look, so I'm trying to get more, dig into the problem more deeply and say, well, what scale am I really trying to control my error rates and what error rates over what inferences and really take the problem more thoroughly simply. This is just kind of one thought experiment to get us to the next stage about those things. It was decidedly non-Bayesian. Yeah, so he asks, is there any Bayes, role for Bayes here? Um, and I, I don't really have a good answer to that. I mean, I, I, I've been um, finding, making more progress here by thinking frequentistly. And um, every time I try to think about these issues in Bayes, I, it doesn't help. Um, what's happening is that a lot of the Bayes is about integration and um, I don't get the fast inner core optimization for me. Um, I have to, I have think things are smooth and therefore I can't use on kind of the subsampling where things go to zero kind of ideas. And so um, I'm a, I, still, I, think it's, I, I think it's a major challenge for the Bayesian community to start to think about big data. I wrote a little president's piece in the ISBA bulletin about but that. But if, if you want to bring it back to the granularity, yeah. then you can't. Yeah, so that's right. So that's the key. He's asking about the granularity, so that I op which I opened with. So to me, the reason, main reason I you know, tend to be more of a Bayesian than a frequentist most of the time is for the, the, the ability to do hierarchical modeling. And this whole granularity issue that I have a lot of data on some people and very little data on massive numbers of people, I've got to share that data across the people and the parameters underlying all of this. And Bayes is the way to do that. And in fact, I would imagine that if you had a really huge data set and massive, you know, petabytes, and a really big model, where the model itself is terabytes, and it was a beautifully connected Bayesian hierarchy, that MCMC might run on that in a blast. It might run on that in milliseconds. Because if you get a little bit of data over here and it sharpens up one parameter posterior, that'll transfer over in your hierarchy to some other parameter, it becomes a prior, and I need now essentially no data to sharpen that up, and it floods across the network. And that, that, that's, no, that's not a, a theorem, it's not a, a bit of experience, it's a wild hope. Um, but I think there's some truth to it, and we just haven't explored, you know, Bayesians never explore the big data regime, uh, looking for this kind of, you know, when the hierarchy really matches for the problem, Will um, MCMC or other, maybe other to be invented Bayesian algorithms actually be surprisingly effective and fast? Uh, but as a, from a theoretician's point of view, I'm even more at a loss because the theory of MCMC is this, you know, eigenvalues of, of uh, hopelessly hard, you know, hard to control matrices, and I, I, mean, I have no way to, I would love to match that up to computational ideas, and I have no, no hope at this point. Big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for things like things where bootstrap might fail, like things about the, the diversity of the data, like the number of key values or whatever, uh, there's a lot to be gained by the fact that you're actually looking at the Yeah. So there's many good aspects of your question. One of them is about streaming. I didn't say hardly anything about streaming. But there's very natural ways to do, if I really have a streaming source, which I may or may not have, I could create a streaming source, but if I have a really streaming source, it's arriving at some central computer, I have 200 processors sitting there ready to get subsamples of it, or resamplings, I can just take each data point and do a little Poisson 
samples, say go to that processor and that one and that one. And then the next data point, go to this one, this, this one. I can create my, my resamplings on the fly. All right, so we haven't exploited that here, but that's a whole research area of its own uh, to be exploited. Um, and uh, sorry, the second part of your, I, I was going to make another comment on the second whole, repeat what you said at the second half of your question. Well, so, so you can actually make decisions about samples. Yes, all right, okay. Right, okay, so sampling is the other point, yes. So lots of statistical problems come about because there's a non-IED sampling pattern of some kind, and you want to sample in your resamplings in a way that respects that. Um, and moreover, you want to do stratified sampling of some kind. And moreover, if your data are already distributed, you want to respect that distributed nature in your, in your resampling. You don't want to be sending data among processors. So there's a, another whole area of research that basically tries to merge how do you do smart stratified distributed sampling for the purposes of things like the bootstrap. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Can I go back to a slide? Yeah. It's clearly the smaller one. Yeah, it's it's a better error bar. Now what'll happen is the bootstrap will come down to exactly probably that same error value. That's the floor for this. The, the n is being keep effect constant here, the number of data points. The, the errors are not going to zero. They would go zero if I let the number of data points get large, but I'm not doing that. Uh, it's really faster. I'm not claiming in this talk that it gives a better final answer. It's just doing it so much faster that it's becoming real life threat relevant. Whereas the bootstrap is going to be real life irrelevant for many, many problems at scale. But I'm not claiming that the actual answer you get out, if you were to wait 30,000 seconds for the bootstrap, will be worse than this. I don't think that would be the case. Yeah. Okay, um, that's all we have time for today. I want to thank you guys. Thank you.